Hallelujah. Amen. You may stand to your feet if you so desire. Let us give the Lord a hand praise. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Won't you pray with me? Most wise, everlasting Father, Lord, we come saying thank you for this privilege and this opportunity to be in the land of the living once more and again. Lord, we thank you, O oh God. Holy Spirit, we welcome your presence that met us here when we arrived this morning, O oh God, and we just say thank you. God, we thank you for those that are present. We ask your travel and mercies for those that are on their way, dear Heavenly Father. Holy Spirit, however you show up, however you bless us, we'll be grateful, oh God, through the ministry, through the word, through the spoken word, through the song, however you come, we'll just say thank you, for we are grateful for this opportunity. Now, to Heavenly Father, we lift this prayer. It's in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, and we said, amen. amen. Our opening hymn this morning is, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior number 162 in the hymnal. Sometimes we say it like this, Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, please don't do it without me. Amen.
before I take my seat as we prepare, let me just say that we have a guest today uh, in the person of the Reverend Dr. Kirk Johnson, who is with us as a guest preacher today. We want to be able to welcome our, our guest, Dr. Johnson, as he joins us. Uh, his bio is in your bulletin, but just to let you know a little bit about him, Kirk is my friend. I've known him since my, the first day I visited Drew Seminary, Drew Theological School. He walked me around the campus and made sure I needed to, I got to where I needed to go. Uh, come to find out, as we had conversation, his mother was one who took care of Pierce at her Montessori school in her early days. And it was wonderful to know that uh, somebody that raised such a great young man had also had a hand in helping my daughter uh, in her early days. Uh, Dr. Johnson is a, uh, a faith leader. He's uh, recently ordained in the United Church of Christ. Uh, he is a consultant. He's got a firm that he found, Peculiar Capital, and they are serving and doing uh, uh, seminars and webinars and all sorts of education, especially along the lines of race and justice and medicine for, uh, for Fortune 500 companies. He is a chaplain at Rutgers University helping to take care of the spiritual needs of the Protestant students on the campus of Rutgers University. And he is an assistant professor uh, at Montclair State University, teaching again at the intersection of race and medicine and justice. Uh, uh, Dr. Johnson has a number of different identities, uh, identities, a number of different vocations, a number of different interests, and is uh, one who comes to us today as uh, he is a lover of God and a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you don't mind, we'll, we did this a little early, but we, this is a good place to do it. If you don't mind just reaching your hand, your right hand forward toward Dr. Johnson. And repeat after me. Uh, Reverend Johnson, Reverend Johnson. Preach, the word. preach the word. Preach with power. Preach with power. And allow the Lord to use you. Amen. Amen. Uh, after uh, we, we will we will hear from him as uh, uh, as word is proclaimed later in our program, and we pray that God will use him. My Amen. Thank you. 
everybody. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Lord, I can do better than that. Praise the Lord, everybody. Sullivan, First Lady Sullivan, to Reverend Turner, all of the deacons, evangelists, missionaries, everybody in their respective places. I bid you greetings and good morning. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be here with you. Um, it's a pleasure just to worship together. Say amen. amen. Scream. Amen. amen. <laughs> oh my goodness. What well, great it is for those who love the Lord to dwell together That's right. in unity. Our scripture today will be from the Gospel of John. John chapter 20. A familiar story to those in faith and to our Bible scholars. The story of Doubting Thomas. John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. If you haven't, say amen. amen. If you don't, say wait a minute. Oh, I heard wait a minute over there, okay. John chapter 20, <laughs> praise God. Verses 24 and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, even though I grew up on the King James Version, but I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And it reads, and of course for those who are able, it's part of tradition to stand for the reading of God's Word, if you can. And it reads, But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told them, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand and his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not yet seen and yet have come to believe. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. O oh God, our help in ages past, and our hope in years to come, reprove, rebuke, exhort, heal, deliver, and set free. Holy Spirit, saturate us with your presence this morning. We pray for those that are dwelling together in present, in person, and for those who will be watching over Facebook and over many streaming services, that your Holy Spirit will saturate them in their living room, in their bedroom, wherever they are witnessing and hearing your word. Gracious God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, because truly you are our strength. And you are our Redeemer. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. 
once again, I want to thank my good friend, Pastor Fred Sullivan, for inviting me here today. And I'm blessed to give him a little bit of a reprieve of preaching on a well-needed vacation, especially the year that we had, the past couple of years, amen? amen? We all need some time to reconnect and to center ourselves in Christ amen. and to rest. Allow me for a brief moment, people of God, to talk about a subject called character in your wounds. Character in your wounds. People of God, close your eyes just for a moment and imagine being a child. Yeah, that's right. Go way back in the day. Back in time. Then imagine yourself playing in the playground or the park. Randomly, you are running around with no place to go. You're playing football, foosball, basketball, tag, freeze tag for the advanced kids. Manhunt, jump rope, double dutch, hopscotch, four corners, wall ball, and patty cake. You're playing on the swings, monkey bars, and the slides. You're having a great time, and suddenly you fall. You fall flat on your face, or your hands, arms, elbows, knees, and legs. At first, you are in shock of what happened to you. Then in a flash, you feel the stinging pain and the blood dripping down from the wound you acquired by falling. You burst out crying because of this pain. Your mother, father, aunt, uncle, big brother, big sister, grandmammy, grandpappy, come urgently over to wipe your tears, ease your pain, and clean the wound that was a result of you unexpectedly falling. Now, people of God, open your eyes. You see, some of us at this point will go through the two-minute, dramatic, Oscar-worthy performance through the pain and the agony we just encountered. Afterwards, you realize you're okay and continue to play. Some of us being many drama kings and queens like myself as a child would be fed up with what happened and go home. What's so interesting about the wounds we receive as children is that they are still with us today. They transform themselves. The wounds we received when we were kids turned into scabs, and then later, scars. Today, I still have scars from my childhood, like one right here, when I fell and almost broke my arm. As I reflect, I laugh about my reaction when I had scabs. Being a little boy, it was a symbol of bragging rights. The little boys in kindergarten saw the scabs on my knees, and they stood in awe. My response was, yeah, I got this sliding down the slide. My kindergarten classmates instigating, you know, there were always instigators no matter what age you are. They comment, you did not get these scabs off the slide. How high was it, Kurt? I bet it was just five feet tall. My response, nah, man. It was a 10-foot slide, the one that you were scared to get on, that I slid down. In your face. The whole kindergarten class was an amazement. I felt like a boss supporting those nasty scabs. They were my bragging rights. Because of the scabs, it made me look cool. The scabs made me look like I was tough. Indeed, the scabs gave me character. They represented character in my wounds. People of God, John, this gospel for our text today, introduces us to the only written recording of the Apostle Thomas transcendent experience with Jesus Christ. The experience of Thomas and Jesus is not recorded in any other gospels. We do not see this in the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke. And for our Bible scholars out there, synoptic means to see with a common view. Indeed, John expresses an experience 
that truly is not seen in a common view. John expresses a mysterious and unique experience of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, called the Christ. Thomas, one of the twelve. Thomas, the apostle. Thomas, one of the founding fathers of the church. Thomas, hailed Judas Thomas, or Judas the twin, by the Syrians. Thomas, a.k.a., otherwise known as Didymus, meaning the twin. Thomas, a.k.a., otherwise known as Doubting Thomas, was M.I.A., y'all. He was mission in action. Jesus, in his resurrected body, made an appearance to his disciples. The scripture says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto him, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so I sent you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whatsoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. People of God, if we look in new, um, pneumatology, which is the study of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit, we see that before the day of Pentecost ever came, the disciples received the Holy Spirit, not in doves of covering the clothes of fire, the tongues of fire, but Jesus breathed yeah, yeah. on them and gave them the Holy Spirit. So when we see in the day of Pentecost, they got a double dose <laughs> of the Holy Ghost. The first one in this account, people of God, mm -hmm. but the second one during the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. uh, also, a question that appears to me is where was Thomas when Jesus first appeared to the disciples? No one knows. Mm -hmm. The disciples were afraid and hid when Jesus died. Thomas might have still been hiding himself. Thomas' appearance is something or lack of appearance is something of a mystery. Why was he the only disciple not to be there at the very important time of Jesus' post-resurrection, which was the appearance of the risen Christ to his disciples? As a matter of fact, the last time we see Thomas in the Gospel of John was six chapters earlier in chapter 14. Yet Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may also be. And where I go, you know. And the way you know, you will also be. People of God, here comes Thomas. And he said, Jesus, my Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The last question Thomas asked Jesus in Scripture the last question Thomas asked Jesus before he died. The last question Thomas asked Jesus before he touched his wounds was, where are you going, Jesus, and how can we know the way? People of God, I know that there is not a concrete answer where Thomas was when Jesus first appeared to his disciples. I know Thomas was curious about where Jesus was going, though. And he was equally curious of trying to find the directions to where Jesus was going. Yes. 
So people of God, I started to use my sanctified and for sanctified imagination, Reverend Turner. And I conclude that Thomas was not there because he was looking for Jesus. Mm -hmm. He looked high and he looked low. He looked up and he looked down. He looked left and he looked right. Mm -hmm. But he could not find Jesus. Mm -hmm. Reverend Johnson, are you sure that you are biblically correct? Are you orthodoxy is correct in this? Is not Jesus with us all the time? Is not Jesus omnipresent, meaning that he is everywhere at the same time? Is not Jesus so high that you can't go over him? Is not Jesus so low that you cannot go under him? Is not Jesus so wide that you cannot go around him? Preacher, what are you talking about that Thomas was looking for Jesus? Well, that is a good theological argument, Pastor Sullivan. And you are right. Jesus, who is God, is ubiquitous, he, meaning that he is everywhere at the same time. However, we need people of God to understand that Jesus was in the unknowns of unknowns. Jesus was in places and realms and territories that no human being can penetrate or find under their own power. In other words, he went down to hell, preached the revival, and took the keys from Satan. Secondly, there is a difference between presence and manifestation. You see, people of God, presence is the state or fact of being physically present. Like us today, with others in a particular place, at a particular time. But the distinction between presence is that manifestation is to make clear or evident to the eye. To show plainly. In other words, someone or something is being revealed. For example, when you go to the eye doctor, can I get a witness in here? Amen. When I take off my glasses, or when you take off your glasses, you cannot see clearly in front of the objects that are in front of you. You do not know what that object is. It's blurry. But that object is still in your presence. The difference is when you put on your glasses, the object that you could not perceive before manifests itself. Mm -hmm. It makes itself clear. It is evident to your eyes that you are looking at the eye chart or that chair. People of God, this is an example with Thomas. We see old Thomas missing the manifestation of Jesus the first time. The other disciples therefore said to Thomas, we have seen the Lord. He said to them, unless I see his hands and the print of his nails, I'll put my finger into the print of his nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. I could not imagine Thomas's Perception. Why Thomas is so salty, people of God? Why is he so uptight in this? Thomas was looking for Jesus all the time and could not find him. That might be the answer. I can hear Thomas now. I'm bewildered, y'all. I'm tired. I'm stressed out. And it seems like everything is in chaos. I've been looking for Jesus all this time. And he is nowhere to be found. Yeah. Eight days have passed and Jesus is nowhere to be found. He said he was going to be resurrected, but I don't see him. Mm -hmm. And it has been all these days and I still have not seen my Lord. The disciples must be lying to me that they saw him. Jesus did not rise from the dead. Six, we have to realize that this was a stressful time in our Christian history. Jesus, the leader of the later to be called Christian church, died. Thomas was not the only one that was worried when Jesus died. Countless Christians from around the region were worried of what was to become of them and what is going to happen to their faith. In the midst of Jesus not being found and in the midst of this chaos, Thomas is chilling out with the disciples in a room with the door shut 
type. Mm -hmm. all right. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes in and says, peace be unto you. People of God, isn't this amazing when we're going through tough times, when we are looking for Jesus, while we should sit and still and know that God is God. In the time of trouble, God will step in your mess. God will step in your trial and say, peace, my daughter. Peace, my son, be with you. So many times we are looking for Jesus when Jesus is looking for us. Jesus is always there, but there comes an appointed time when Jesus manifests himself. Notice that as soon as Thomas stopped looking for Jesus, Jesus manifested himself. He put on his spiritual glasses mm -hmm. and he was able to see Christ as Christ was and is. Then Jesus said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. People of God, here we see the first and only physical vindication of Jesus' resurrection. People have seen Jesus after resurrection, but they never touched Jesus. The only exception is the Apostle Paul, excuse me, the Apostle Thomas' experience with Christ. Here we see the intimate interaction of rabbi and student, Messiah and believer human being and God. Thomas was touching the wounds of sin on the God of victory. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So for all the folks who have wounds not just the wounds we acquired as kids, but wounds in our minds, wounds in our hearts, wounds in our emotions, wounds in your body, wounds in past relationships, wounds in present relationships, wounds of hate, wounds of sexism and misogyny, wounds of racism, wounds in your family, Wounds in your marriage, wounds in your household, wounds in your neighborhoods, and wounds in your health. You've been hopping to church. You've been trying and limping through the storms of life. People see your wounds as weakness. They talk about you. They lie on you. They cheat on you. They oppress and demonize you. They look down on you and think that you are disposable. I'm here to tell you, people of God, that there is character in your wounds. These are the wounds of life. They show the goodness of the Lord. They show the grace of the Lord in my life. They show the mercy of the Lord in my life. They show the strength of the Lord in my life. They show the protection of the Lord in my life. They show the favor of the Lord in my life. And most importantly, they show the power of the Lord in my life. So the scabs I received while I was in kindergarten, the scabs of life are shown. But because Jesus' wounds, my particular wounds, your particular wounds are turned into victory. Does not matter how deep your wounds are. Does not matter how long you had those wounds even through the bondage of domestic violence and toxic relationships. Cut those people out of your life. Seek prayer and seek meditation. Yep. Seek therapy and seek counseling. Yep. Again, cutting those toxic people out of your life. Yep. Seek protection and seek refuge. Mm. Do healthy practices. Focus on self-discipline and do self-care. And when you do these things, people of God, your wounds through the power of Christ will be healed. People of God, you have character in your wounds. 
you will move from being a victim to a victor. Because we're more than conquerors in Christ who love us. And your wounds will be seen as a testimony in your growth, in your renewal, in your healing, and your perseverance. People of God, there is character in your wounds. Let it be so. And the people of God say, Amen. Amen. opportunity to know that Jesus shows up even when we have shut the doors and locked them. Even when we are no longer sitting and looking but cowering and hurting, Jesus can still show up. We offer opportunity now for somebody who may have heard these words and is sitting in their own, in their own place wondering what is going to happen tomorrow as they sit and wait and try to figure out who is coming to their rescue. Jesus is able to do that. And there might be some wound that we're carrying that we need to be healed from. And here Jesus offers the opportunity for that healing, uh, for that connection, for us to follow and to follow closely. And here is our opportunity. Whether within ourselves or if you were to reach out to us and let us know that you want us to pray for you on your new Christian journey. Uh, here is an opportunity for that right now. And also for those like, like the disciples, like the apostles who were sitting and waiting and wondering what comes next after some defining moment in all of our lives. What comes next? Where is God leading me now? How does Jesus show up in my life? And how do I help somebody else to see the one who made his way through the locked door? Here's our opportunity to rededicate it, just to say, God, I know that you have something else for me and that I can continue on as I sit and I wait and I look for the one who's got the message for me to continue on. Help me now to commit to tomorrow's work and worship. Amen. Amen. Friends, we are thankful for your continued faithfulness and your support of our ministry at Bethlehem through your time and your talent and your treasure. And we continue to appeal to you to be faithful unto God, to give that which God has gifted you with a portion back to God here at this ministry in Bethlehem. We need your time. We are looking for folks who are able to help the ministry along, to, to do the work of ministry in our auxiliary teams, in our uh, ministry of audiovisual, even in song. If you would like to sing with us, we would like to put your gifts and talents to work in the ministry at Bethlehem. Certainly, we, we ask that you would also give unto us, uh, either through the mail at our mailing address, 587 Reverend Tony E. Jackson, Senior Way, Newark, New Jersey, 07107, or through our online giving channel, through Givelify. You can access that on our website, BethlehemNewark.org forward slash donate, and also on your mobile device, wherever you get your apps from. We look forward to being able to take that which God has gifted you with that you choose to give to us for the work of ministry, to help somebody else, to keep our fellowship going with the financial resources that you are able to provide, but to also do bigger and better things for people in our context, in our region, in our city, at Bethlehem. Whichever way you give, we are thankful and we are praying to God that you will be blessed for that which you have given unto God here at Bethlehem. God bless you. People of God, as we go forth into this wicked world, we pray that we understand that there is indeed character 
in our wounds because there is character in the wounds that you have sacrificed for each and every one of us. Let us continue to take care of ourselves, our mental health, our physical health, and our spiritual health so that we will be the people that you have called us to be. God, we thank you and we love you. Protect us as we go forth to another week. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.